guest for you. Um, the lady that's going to be speaking tonight, uh, I met her first through one of my podcast guests and she was kind enough to come on and did a smashing job. I'm sure all of you, I know at least one of you has li have listened to it to kind of get a preview. Um, our, our guest tonight is, and now is the doctor or just Ann? I wish, no. Okay, well, I, 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 I probably, you, you seem very doctoral, so I never, I never, uh, anyway, tonight is, uh, we have the pleasure and the honor of having Ann Misty. She is the, and I'm going to cheat a little bit and read it right off her uh, LinkedIn bio, the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Union Station Homeless Services, which is not just out of, it's in Pasadena, but you cover the entire San Gabriel Valley, we're the county's lead designated agencies, mm -hmm. so we coordinate all homeless services throughout San Gabriel Valley. And as a just as a little bit of background, Anne has been a, is a nationally recognized expert on these on strategic, innovative, and effective. And I especially like the effective part: solutions to ending homelessness. Um, she's been invited on numerous occasions to speak at the White House. You know Michelle Obama personally, right? I worked on her uh, joining forces for homeless veterans campaign. And a whole list of others that I'm going to let you uh, decide on which ones you'd like us to know best. Because literally, I think there's about 20 different organizations here. <laughs> but um, everything from housing and urban development, uh, um, Department of Labor, Health and Human Services, uh, one I like particularly is the Veterans Affairs. If anybody deserves your help, it's them. And uh, like they used to say, and a whole host of others. Um, so if I can impl implore everyone to give Ann Misty a little round of applause. Thank you, Thank you everybody. It is a real pleasure to be here tonight uh, in Claremont. I had the privilege of having dinner in the village um, what a what an amazing an amazing place that was so charming city uh, and thank you for having me so thank you to Russ for the kind introduction uh, yeah I have many years of working in the issue on the issue of homelessness both nationally from a policy systems perspective I've worked in communities throughout the country on this issue um, and at one point in my career as I was doing all of the sort of 60,000 feet working, as Russ said, with the White House, working with cities and states all over the country, I realized that, well, what happened is a gentleman, I was walking to work to one, one day and a gentleman came up and stopped in front of me and he put out his hand and he said, help the homeless. And I looked at him and I thought, didn't say it, of course, I thought, that's what I do for a living and I, don't know how to help you. And that was the catalyst for me moving from national to taking a job in Skid Row and working directly with people experiencing homelessness in Skid Row. So I feel that if you're going to get to the bottom of what is one of the major crises of our times, you have to understand it from both sides. You have to understand what are the policies that create homelessness. And yes, it is the policies that create homelessness, not the people. And then what are people experiencing who are living on the streets? And what are the experiences of communities dealing with this issue? And how do we work together to solve it? Now, sadly, it is an issue that is rife with myths misperceptions and often approached from a place of fear and misunderstanding both to what are the causes 
and what are the solutions. So today I'm going to take you on a bit of a historical journey to say why are we at this point in our country with homelessness and what are the, some of the things we can do going forward. And there will be time, I'm sure, for questions. As many as you can. Absolutely. 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 <laughs> so, let me get my thing here. Okay, so, these are the numbers in Los Angeles County. We are, oh, the nation, sorry. You'll see 582,000, the county, and um, the numbers, sadly, have been growing in the last couple of years. Ah, sorry. Make sure I pay attention. How do you get those numbers? There we go. Those are nationally counted numbers. They are done through uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development. It is legislated that we do a count at least every two years. A lot of communities like Los Angeles County does it annually. So is it a perfect count? Of course not because that would be impossible, but it does give us a snapshot. It's a, it's a point in time on a certain day. They try to pick the day when you're gonna get the most people. And what it is really helpful for more than anything is to see the trends. And also they've started to do more demographic studies to really look at not just the numbers, but who are the people, what are the issues they're facing? You know, how many women, how many men, how many veterans, families, how many people of color, all of those things are tracked in the, in the count. So again, is it perfect? It's not, but it does give us somewhat of an accurate picture nationally. The San Gabriel Valley, uh, this year they actually didn't do a city by city count, which is unfortunate, but the San Gabriel Valley has just upwards of 5,000 people who uh, have been identified as experiencing homelessness. When you say the San Gabriel Valley, does this include the Pomona Valley? Yes, this includes Pomona. The two cities with the highest counts are Pomona and Pasadena at each end of the thing. And then there are some hot spots within the San Gabriel Valley. Um, over the last few years, some cities have seen dramatic increases and some cities have seen dramatic decreases and it is directly correlated with what the city did. The actions that the cities took will affect whether your numbers go up or whether your numbers go down. So it's not random. Whoops. All right, homelessness. Now, anybody here who can remember the 60s and 70s, and I'm not gonna ask who that is, <laughs> will probably remember a time when homelessness wasn't really a thing. We didn't talk about it, it wasn't in the news, you didn't see it on the streets. You know, maybe occasionally you'd see somebody walk down the street, you know, kind of that shopping cart. But generally it wasn't something we talked about. In fact, homelessness was not a thing in this country except for two previous periods in our country. The first, the Civil War. At the end of the Civil War, you saw a spike in homelessness. But the interesting thing about homelessness at that time is it was mostly men returning from war. They'd been displaced. There weren't the jobs available. And so homelessness was not about housing. Everybody could afford a home. It was about jobs. So people started to travel the rails, <coughs> go around looking for jobs. And at first there was the recognition this was soldiers coming back. Very, very quickly, the narrative changed to these are bums and hobos. These are people who don't want to work. These are morally, people with moral deficits. It very quickly turned from a, an issue of the country, the results of war, the lack of jobs to it's the people who are bad. Then we saw Again, decrease and then the depression hit. Same thing in the depression. What caused people to be homeless was not housing. It was jobs, the bread lines, people traveling the country for jobs. 
And then we saw World War II happen. There were lots of jobs, unfortunately, again, for all of these young men. After the war, the government did a lot to support returning soldiers. It was very different than the Civil War. That's when we saw the growth in the middle class. We did not see homelessness. So what happened? Well, a whole bunch of things happened at around the same time, and some that were from a long time ago, but it all culminated in a moment in time. So up until the late 70s, homelessness was so small in this country, they didn't even count it. So the 1970s and 80s, what happened? Well, a few things happened together. The Vietnam War. The Vietnam War ended in 75. You have soldiers returning from Vietnam and once they were let out of the military, there was little or no support. It's very different now. The VA has stepped out much differently, but after the Vietnam War, there was very little support. The other thing that happened is during the Vietnam War, they started to recognize PTSD and trauma, even though they didn't call it that at that point. They started to see a lot of soldiers experiencing trauma because of war. How was that treated? It was treated with drugs. It was treated with prescription medication. The soldiers come back. They're no longer in the military. They're in the community. They're still dealing with the emotional trauma, but they don't have access to the drugs. So what happens to deal with those issues? There was starting to look at street drugs as a way to self-medicate. It wasn't a moral issue. These weren't bad people. They were suffering terribly from PTSD. And yet there were little or no societal supports. A large part of the, the chronically homeless population were veterans in the 1970s. Didn't, weren't they also coming back with addicted to drugs? Most of the addiction was actually because of the medical approach. Was there some other addiction? Again, people will self-medicate when they're dealing with trauma. It's not a moral defect, it's a way people have of dealing with trauma. There have been all sorts of studies that show that if you have experienced trauma, especially if you've experienced childhood trauma, but even as an adult, you are more likely to become addicted. It actually, there's brain chemistry involved with addiction. Remember that, addiction is a disease, it's not a moral defect. So, what are some of the other issues? So we have the end of the Vietnam War. Now, how many people here know that it was the closing of the mental institutions that caused so many people to be homeless? Great. I hate to tell you this, but that's not the case. And it was something I believe and spoke, to, spoke about a lot of <coughs> times because it was just a common, it was the closing of the mental institutions. That's why we have mentally ill people on the street. And there's a push now to redo mental institutions and put everybody inside. <coughs> what happened was mental institutions started to close in the 1950s. Why? Because of the development of psychotropic medication. You could now give people medicine that enabled them to live in community. That combined with exposés on the horrors of mental institutions, you saw them closing down and people going into community. <coughs> By the late 1960s, almost all the institutions were closed. There was only a handful. It was under Jimmy Carter that the final ones were closed down. But what Jimmy Carter did was he put federal funding into local community mental health support to help people. You didn't see people becoming homeless because they had mental health, because there was support, there was medication, and another very important factor. If you do have a severe mental illness and you are on disability, 
in those times, you could afford an apartment. You could afford to live. Right now, if you're on disability for a mental health issue, you get $1,200 a month. How many places can you rent and buy food and all of the other things you need on a total income of $1,200? So what happened in 1980? So Carter, this isn't about politics, but this is about what administrations did. Jimmy Carter put all this money into the Mental Health Act for local community mental health support. It was one of the first things that Reagan did when he came into, power, into, um, into government was completely shut that down completely. Took all the local mental health dollars away. So that's when you started, and then as housing prices started to go up, and if you didn't have other support, people with any kind of disability who didn't have money, didn't have family support, would end up falling into homelessness. Housing discrimination. How many people here know redlining? Does everybody know what redlining is? So of course what redlining <coughs> did was keep people of color out of the housing market. And it is through home ownership that you have intergenerational equity and wealth. You also are not affected by rising rents. So you have whole communities, and this is something important about redlining. Undesir it wasn't undesirable neighborhoods that were redlined. These were almost all middle class, healthy neighborhoods. They talked about making the people were undesirable, not the area, it was the people. It was racism, complete racism. So you have whole communities who are now in the rental market, rental part market skyrockets. You also create deserts, ghettos where there's no opportunity, jobs, parks. You may not know that public housing up until the late 1980s, early 90s, it was illegal to have grocery stores in the United States by public housing. So you couldn't even get good to healthy food. So these were all policies. These weren't the people. The war on drugs and mass incarceration pointed directly at people of color. We have recordings of Nixon saying this very thing. The war on drugs has harmed more people than drugs ever have. It has put an entire generation of young men into the criminal justice system, coming out with criminal records who cannot get housing and they cannot get jobs. And then evictions it's interesting about evictions. Evictions are to women of color what criminalization is to men of color. If you are a black woman and you miss a rent payment, the average length of time before you receive an eviction notice in this country is six days. If you are a white man who doesn't pay his rent, it's six months to a year. Black women are the number one group that is evicted from housing. Then we have gentrification. I don't think I need to go into that. We're seeing that happen all over. And as housing prices become more and more expensive, the middle class was turning to lower income areas and gentrifying, again, creating problems with people losing their opportunity to have housing. This is the big one. This is the major reason. Sorry, my slides are a little messy. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> So, in 1980, when Reagan came into power, the United States produced about 600,000 units a year of affordable housing. Within three years, it was down to 6,000 units of affordable housing. 26 billion to 8 billion on affordable housing. The assistance budget cut by 60%. This is the first time they started to talk about the deserving poor versus the undeserving poor. And then the welfare bum, the mom, you know, the welfare mom, all started at this time. When Reagan came to power in 1980, there were very few, probably in the thousands of people experiencing homelessness in the United States. By 1983, they estimate it was up to 3 million people. 
that did not have anything to do with alcohol, drugs, mental health. It had to do with the lack of affordable housing. That is why we have the crisis we have today. It is not the person, it is the policy. So, what is the cause of homelessness? Lack of affordable housing. Doesn't matter if you have a mental illness or a drug addiction. There are, and don't quote me on this, but, um, cause I looked it up a while ago, there are about, I believe it's about 45 million people in the country, they think, have substance use issues. There are just over 500,000 people experiencing homelessness in the United States. They estimate that about 30% of that population has a substance use issue. So we're talking probably 150 to 180,000 people who are experiencing homelessness have substance use issues. The other 44 million whatever are living in houses. If there was a direct correlation, you would see way more people on the street with drug addiction. Same is true with mental health. We all know people in our neighborhoods, in our families, in our workplaces who suffer from mental health. It does not cause homelessness. It can make you more vulnerable. The analogy I use is COVID. Remember when COVID first started, what did we hear? Who are the most vulnerable to COVID? If you're over 65, if you have a chronic illness, you are more likely to get sick and or to die of COVID. Nobody said that being over 65 causes homelessness or causes COVID. It makes you more vulnerable to, homeless, to COVID. It makes you more vulnerable to homelessness. It is not a cause of. And that's a really important thing to remember because we always blame the individual and governments are notorious for doing that because it takes the responsibility from them from solving the problem and puts it on the person rather than on <coughs> the policy. So again, these are the factors we say that make you more vulnerable. Discrimination, poverty, bureaucracy. I can talk to you forever about bureaucracy. I promise I won't. <laughs> Stagnant wages and the rising cost of living. I looked up Claremont today. Claremont is in the top 8% of the most expensive cities in the world. The average rental for a one bedroom is well over $2,000 a month. If you are a person living under disability payments, if you are a senior on fixed income, by the way, the, the the fastest growing population in the homeless population are seniors who have worked their whole lives or been homemakers and they retire on a fixed income. We are seeing people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s become homeless. The cost of living in California is insane. That again is why we see the numbers here that you may not see in other places. Again, these are the personal things that people have. Domestic violence is one of the number one, it is the number one indicator for women experiencing homelessness, is domestic violence. Yes, addiction, physical and mental health. 45% of foster kids will become homeless by the time they're 26, 45%. That is a failure of our system, not a failure of the young kids who've ended up in foster care. Trauma is one of the most important words you can learn when you're looking at homelessness. So many people experience trauma that can lead to other things, but not everybody experiences homelessness because of trauma. But everybody who experiences homelessness <coughs> has trauma. It is one of the most traumatic things you can experience. And what happens when you experience trauma? Your, your brain physically changes. You are in what is called fight or flight mode because you live every second of every day in fear of your life. 
And when the body is in this constant state, think about driving down the road, you know, the highway, and somebody just pulls in front of you and you have to jerk your car and your heart is going and you're like, oh my God, I just about died. That's what people live with 24 seven. What that does is cause the brain to act in ways that mimic mental illness. So when we say people on the street, all this mental illness, yes, if you're talking trauma, but the numbers of people who suffer from severe mental illness is, is much smaller. So trauma is a leading indicator of homelessness. So do they categorize trauma then as mental illness? Yes, I mean, it's sort of anything that affects the brain. What we know from people living on the street is trauma is everywhere and it, it creates, so things like agitation, fear, paranoia, the inability to make good decisions, all of those things that you know we do see in the homeless population. But what we also see is when people get stabilized and you take them out of that environment, they very quickly come back to what we call the resilient <coughs> zone where they can handle. I met a gentleman recently who was living on the street and twice he was diagnosed, you know, he would be taken in for a hold, he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, twice. He could have been locked up under some of the new rules that are coming down. Instead, he got housed with supportive services, and he was totally fine. All of those symptoms disappeared. He was not schizophrenic, he was not paranoid. Now, that's not to say there aren't people out there who are. There's a small percentage that absolutely need a higher level of care, and we do a lousy job at that. But that is not the majority. So, responses to homelessness. Again, I'm gonna take you through a little bit of history. When homelessness first hit in the late 70s, early 80s, there was nothing that was, nobody was prepared for it. There were no programs, there, were no, there was no anything. And who was it that first stepped up? It was faith groups. They said, it is terrible that people are living on the street like this. So that is the beginning of the missions. And we call them three hots in a cot. In other words, the old picture of lining up to get a bed overnight, which you had to leave early in the morning. First come, first serve. A lot of food provided for people. And that was it. That's how we started as an organization. Exactly that way. It was done with compassion and care, but there was no end in sight. It was an emergency response. So the numbers got bigger and bigger. As the numbers grew, we started to see in the 1990s criminalization because these are obviously bad people. They're obviously bad people. They're addicts, they're all of this stuff, so we're gonna arrest them and get them off the street. We're starting to see some more of that happening. That was a complete and absolute abject failure and we saw the numbers skyrocket because all you did is create more barriers to the people who were arrested and again the arrests weren't because they attacked somebody or these were what we call quality of life crimes sleeping on a park bench standing in front of a business peeing in the gutter because nobody will let you into their place to use their bathroom these were the kinds of arrests so we saw huge numbers of people experiencing homelessness. The thing about Los Angeles County that's important, if you were homeless in those years, you were shipped to Skid Row. So it was kept contained, so nobody thought it was a real problem. It was the bums in Skid Row. When the law changed to say you can't ship people to Skid Row, then people stayed in their own communities, so everybody started to see it, it became much more visible. Then we, had, we moved into this idea of compliance, that housing is a privilege and you have to work to, to get housing. So you've got people who are traumatized, desperate, living in fear on the streets, and you say, if you jump through these 15 hoops, we'll reward you with housing. Now, if you're struggling with trauma, mental illness, addiction, all of these things, how do you jump through those hoops? How do you do that? Think about it. We all have issues that we struggle 
Okay, all of us, I'm not going to ask any of those things. Can you imagine being in a place where you don't know where you're going to sleep, eat, or you may be attacked and murdered or raped, but you better deal with losing 10 pounds. We all know that if you're not in a situation where you have support, where you feel stable, you can't work on whatever it is. But instead, we were saying to people, you've got to fix yourself. We're going to give you a little bit of help, but not a lot. And then you can have a home, but we're actually not going to help you get find a home. That's on you. The only people that were successful were people that didn't have barriers. So the numbers of people actually getting back into housing and community was tiny. So what happened in the 2000s? Well, there was a psychologist living in New York who worked with homeless men with substance abuse issues and did all the stuff that they'd been trained to do. You know, put them in treatment programs, get them into drug treatment, get them counseling, let them have a shower, we'll get them a meal. And he said it wasn't working. Nobody was getting that. So on his home, he said, how do we work with people when they're not stable to try to help them towards health and wellness? So he went out on his own and rented some apartments and he put these men directly from the street into the apartment. And guess what? It was wildly successful. Because when people feel safe and stable, they can then start to get well. So he provided services to these people, but they knew where they were going to sleep that night. They didn't have to worry about finding food. Just a note, average homeless person eats two meals a week. So when people ask you for money, you go, well, it's going to go to drugs. More than likely, it's going to go to food. So that was the beginning of what we call the Housing First moment, movement. And there's a lot of myths and a lot of negativity about Housing First, but I'll talk about that in a minute. What we started to see was reductions in the number of homelessness, and the evidence showed that this was the approach that worked. It took 20 years for us to figure out that the solution to homelessness was a home. Homelessness is not having a home. Homelessness is not addiction. Homelessness is not you're a bad person. Homelessness is you don't have a home. If you have a home, you're not homeless anymore. So again, oops, we're going through this. Again, one of the things that's important, there was no coordination nationally at the beginning. It was all a hodgepodge. And again, it was good people, faith groups stepping up out of compassion to want to help. The other thing that came in the 2000s was what we call the continuum of care. And this is where the government said, we need to step up and start funding, but we want to do it in a coordinated way. So we're not just giving money all over. We're actually going to give money to communities that show they're working together to create solutions. So the other thing was, this is really important. We moved from managing homelessness, you know, food, showers, cots, making people more comfortable while they were homeless, to say, why don't we end homelessness for people? And the idea that housing is something that every human being needs and deserves. Now, this is something I want to talk about, how we view those who are homeless. Because again, there's all sorts of myths, all sorts of perceptions out there. And we need to recognize that when we're talking about people who are homeless, we are talking about fellow human beings who don't have a home. Again, previously, it was all of these things. It was, you need to fix yourself. You come to us for help. Even if you didn't have access to us, you had to come to us. We're going to manage it. We're going to tell you what we need, you need to do. And if you can do it, we'll reward you. To, and this was an illness-centered approach. We still see this. What is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? And, can, and, and how do we fix that? And then again, you'll deserve housing. So it was all about the symptoms that people had. 
And then we moved to a whole different view of ending homelessness, people deserve housing, integrated service models. So we all work together in community. We go out to people because it's too hard for them to come to us. My staff go out into encampments, into river valleys, under bridges to meet people where they're at. We have a medical team, doctors, nurses who come out with us to the field. We make it as low barrier as possible. We don't ask people to jump through hoops. I say to my staff, our job is to be hoop jumpers and barrier busters. It's their journey. But if we take away those barriers, people are more likely to move forward. Person-centered. One of the things we know about homelessness, I'm sure you've all heard about service resistance, right? Common thing. Oh, they don't want to be housed. I have a close friend and colleague, and I'll tell you his story. At the age, and he shares this openly and has allowed me to share it. At the age of seven, his father started to sexually abuse him and his younger brother. At the age of 14, he decided to kill himself because he couldn't handle it anymore. And he actually planned on how he was going to kill himself at the age of 14. And then a friend at school offered him drugs. And he got into heroin. And he will tell you that it was the heroin that saved his life. But over the years, he became addicted. And his life fell apart. What changed for him, because there were all of these hoops and all of these barriers, he could not deal with psychologically, emotionally, substance use, all of these things. And then we moved to this idea of low barrier. And a friend of his said, you need help, and dropped him off at an access center in Pasadena. This is our agency. And he walked in and he said, for the first time, someone looked at me and just wrapped their arms around me and told me I mattered. And then they did everything they could to help me on the path. He is now my senior VP of advocacy and community engagement. He spent 15 years as an outreach worker after he got clean, he got his life back together, and he wanted to give back. And he's, he went out for 15 years working with people experiencing homelessness. And he said to me once, in all of the years I was homeless, and drug addicted, which was like 25 years. And the 15 years I've been an outreach worker, I have not met a single person that wanted to be homeless. But what he did say is that if you're living on the street, you have been let down time and time and time again been given promises and told if you do this and this it'll work and it doesn't and these people have lost hope and they have lost trust and somebody come up going up to them and say I've got something to help you they're gonna go no thanks oh well see their service reasons they don't want housing it's about building relationships what my staff does is they go out and they build relationships of trust with these people. And one of the other things that you will hear a lot is people will go out and say, meet a homeless person. What do you need? I need socks. I've got a treatment program for you. <laughs> I need socks. How about you sign up with this program? I need socks. What happens, a person walks away and goes, they're not listening to me, they don't care. So what my staff does is, you need socks? Here are some socks. And then the next day they go back, do you need anything else? Yeah, I need some new clothes. Let's get you some new clothes. And the more they're listened to and that they can trust 
that what we're telling to them is true and real and we will follow up, 99% 0.9% of those people will say, when, when it's time to say, we've got housing for you, they will say yes. They may not say yes at the beginning, but when they trust that what you're telling them is true, they will come in. We cleared and housed two entire encampments a couple of years ago. Why? Because we said, there's the housing, there's a room for you, we can take you over right now. And they're like, are you real? Are you telling them the truth? They say, yeah, we'll take you over. 100% of those people went into housing, 100%. Because they believe that you actually are telling them the truth and that you do have a solution for them. What they don't want is to be told that we have a treatment program. They say, yeah, I've been through a treatment program, then I'm coming back out on the street. What's a treatment program gonna do for me? But if you say, I've got housing for you, temporary, permanent, and then we'll get you what you need, people will say yes. So what are some of the, again, it's about relationships. People are prickly, people are traumatized, they don't trust, they've built a shell. We break through that, we see amazing results. Okay, let's talk housing first. Housing first, people think it's we hear all sorts of things about housing first. You realize that there's a, there's a lot of folks in this crowd that are very concerned about that. Are very concerned about that. I totally understand. I'm, not, I'm watching that. No, no, that's totally fine. And I'm happy to take tough questions. I know that's the truth. A lot of people I talk to. What is housing first to begin with? Housing first is not free housing. Everybody that goes into housing pays rent. They pay 30% of their income, which is the national standard for what you should be paying on your housing. California, it's a lot higher than 30%, but that is a national standard. So, uh, let me just change my slides here, make sure. Clients can do whatever they want. There's no restrictions. It's a free for all. Drugs, alcohol, all that. We don't even allow smoking in our buildings. There's no illegal substances that are allowed. Residents sign a lease just like any one of us here would sign a lease in an apartment. And if you misbehave, if you don't pay your rent, if you cause problems, you can and will be evicted. It's not a free for all. They do, they have to, again, it's just like any other tenant, you have to treat your neighbors with respect, all of those things. This idea that it's gonna be a den of drugs, this is people's fear. Oh my gosh, it's gonna be this housing. We have a building in Pasadena, permanent supportive housing building. We had, oh, massive community pushback. We don't want those people in our community. We don't want those people by our children. We don't want drugs and alcohol. We had a city councilor who had such courage. She went around to every neighbors and said, these are our neighbors. These are people from Pasadena. They deserve housing and we're gonna make it happen. But we're gonna ask you what it should look like. We're gonna ask you what kind of building you want. It got built. It's full. In the, it was built and opened in 2016. Let me tell you how many complaints we have had from residents and neighbors. How many police calls we've had. Zero. In fact, it is the nicest building in the community. And the biggest problem we have is people <coughs> wanting to rent an apartment there. It has raised values in the neighborhood because it is so beautiful. Supportive housing, affordable housing, has higher standards of building than regular buildings. They are beautiful. They are not what we all picture as the projects, you know, and the crime. They're beautiful. They also have staff full time. They have treatment programs. They have therapy. They have job programs. One of our buildings, 20 families moved in. 19 of them weren't working or in school. Only one was. A year later, all of them were either working full time or in college. That's what permanent housing is. 
We don't force people to do anything. Because all the evidence shows if you force people to do programs, they will object, they will resist, they won't do it. What we saw was when we stopped making programs mandatory, the attendance and compliance to programs skyrocketed because it's people's choice. These are adults who have choice, but we encourage, they have case managers that work with them, and we see over time when they're in housing, they will participate more and more in programs. So does it, oh, and I want to talk a little bit about trauma-informed. All of our buildings and all of our approaches trauma-informed. And what that is, is remember I said earlier, like the, the illness approach, what's wrong with you? We don't say what's wrong with you, we say what happened to you. What happened in your life that took you to this place? And then we work to help them. And we also work on resilience and say, what are you really good at? What can you do? They did a study on people who were homeless and then housed, and they asked them what their goals were. Number two was reunification with family, Three, getting back into community, jobs, all of those things. You know what number one was? Giving back to the community. Giving back to the community. So we have different models of housing. So bridge or crisis, which we used to call shelter, supportive housing, rapid rehousing. We actually have more people throughout the San Gabriel Valley living in apartments. You don't even know they're there. We literally have thousands of people who are formerly homeless living in apartments in your community, and you don't know. And then, of course, we do have the congregate buildings. So housing first. The old model, which a lot of people want to bring back, and it's starting to happen, is we have to fix you first. This is the treatment model. You're on drugs. You have to go to a treatment program. We're not putting you in housing. That has a 31 to 45% success rate and is wildly expensive. Just a note, leaving people on the street is about 10 times more costly than providing them with housing to taxpayer dollars. Permanent supportive housing is one of the most cost-effective treatments there is. The success of housing first, 88%, that's the national number. There have been 26 blind studies on the housing first model. Most, many of them here, but also worldwide. That is the result of every study. And these are gold standard studies. The other model, compliance first, has a very low success rate. At Union Station, our success rate, and these are government audited figures, not ours, because we receive government dollars and they audit us up the yin yang, is between 97 to 99%. The people that we get housed do not become homeless again. And that small 1% to 3%, we don't give up on them. It may be that they were in the wrong kind of housing. So we will move them until we find something that works for them. It is successful. It works. The cities that have done this in the San Gabriel Valley have seen amazing, amazing results. Crime does not go up. It goes down because people are not on the streets. They are in housing. They are beautiful. They are safe. And this has been studied all across this country, Canada, Europe, Australia, and New Zealand. This works. Um, this is just a little bit about Union Station. I'll, this is not so interesting. This is where we, we work throughout the San Gabriel Valley. Um, this is how we work. So we do outreach. We do interim or shelter. Permanent housing. This is the building I talked to you about on the left under housing. That is our permanent supportive housing building in Pasadena. And then we work really hard on community integration because it's not just enough to house people. It's how do we get them back into community so that they're no longer those homeless people, they're your neighbor. Um, so this is just some of the things we've, we've served. 
we, we house on average permanently 12 to 1,600 people a year in Sengibo Valley. Um, this is some of our buildings. We have a tiny village, El Monte. We just opened a brand new building last week. This is one of the cities that saw 50% reduction in homelessness because they opened housing and interim housing. These are some of our other buildings. There's Mars Place again. Euclid Villa is another family building. So what ends homelessness? Housing ends homelessness. With comprehensive services, it's not just, we don't just say, there you go. We provide all of those different things. That equals stability. People ask me all the time, because I've done this work for years, what ends homelessness? It's when every single one of us recognizes the humanity in everyone housed or unhoused. How we approach homelessness is a mark of who we are as communities, who we are as people. It is not just doing the right thing, it is doing what we know works. And I know people disagree with me and have questions and that's fine. This comes from both experience of working in this field all over this country for many, many years, massive amounts of research and evidence. It is why the federal government, under a Republican administration, brought in housing first. This is not a left Democrat kind of thing. This is brought in by a Republican administration because they saw it worked and it saved huge amounts of taxpayers' dollars. Anyway, thank you all for listening to me. to have any questions. Throw the hard ones at me if you want. Okay. Yes, please. Okay. Now, in some cases that we're dealing with, we have buildings that are five stories and placed in unique areas where they're going to have lower parking spaces for a mass amount of people. Mm -hmm. All right? Which is questionable. Now, we're not saying that we're not against the homeless, it's just we're against how they're placing these buildings. And the fact that when these buildings were initiated, we weren't informed. The cities weren't informed. The people weren't informed. They came in under the close of darkness. If these places are supposed to be productive, why come in on the cloak of night? Why not present them like you did instead of coming in like these? I mean, that's a really great question and it shouldn't be secretive, but I will also be really honest and tell you that the backlash we get from communities when we try to do housing is so intense that I will give you an example. We were going to do a building in Pasadena. It wasn't in a residential area. It was actually a hotel, kind of on the homeless, or a, a commercial strip. It was the area of the highest homeless population in the city of Pasadena. The city was 100% behind it. They were gonna turn it into beautiful, permanent housing. The city council, funding, everything was fine. Two of the city councilors who were absolutely behind it said, we need to do a community meeting. Somebody in the community, they didn't find out who, got a copy of the letterhead of one of the city councilors and made up a fake letter and delivered it door to door, which was filled with lies that this was all a secret back room door, uh, deal, it was already done, blah, 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 which was not. Totally untrue, and she tried to say that. So we had a community meeting, and it was in a church, and most of the people there were the church members and I sat there for two hours, listened to people scream, yell, say these were not human beings. And my favorite was we should put these people in a field outside, somewhere in San Gabriel Valley, put a barbed wire fence around them and hang a sign that says, when you work, you can get out. And someone said, like the concentration camps in Nazi Germany. And the person said, exactly. 
Well, we have to listen to government bureaucrats tell us that the best way to get homeless people off the street is to put them in million dollar, 400 square foot apartments and give the nonprofits whose executives are making three, four, five hundred grand a year to give them all of our middle class money. And after a period of 50 years, those buildings go to those developers. And in the meantime, Section 8 has gone broke. And Section 8 served these people and these families for a long, long time in the, in the private sector. And now the bureaucrats have taken it over. It's just a big suck uh, for, for the middle class. So remember what I said earlier about bureaucracy and not to get me started? Yeah, <laughs> bureaucracy here in California is absurd. They and, stole Section 8 money. Well, uh, I'll disagree on the Section 8 piece, but we'll get, we can get to that in a moment. But I'll talk to you a little bit about the development of housing. The red tape in the bureaucracy is absurd, and they need to fix it in the state, absolutely. But one of the issues that people don't think about when you're building supportive housing is all of the developers and all of the workers who do the building and all of the inspections and everything has to be paid for. But when you build a market rate housing, your profits come when you rent that, those apartments and you make a profit. In nonprofit housing, you're not making a profit down the road. So the cost of building is more because you have to pay the people who are doing it. So the money comes up front. That plus the bureaucracy creates housing that, yes, is we, we are horrified by it. And steals it from the middle class who could be providing Section 8 money and housing for families that have problems. What about for individuals that have problems? What, what about for youth? 30% of our youth going to college are homeless in this country, 30%. So, and I don't think stealing from the middle class, I would, I would sit, you know, I'm middle class. Um, no, you're not. How much are you making in this, in, this, in this position here? You're not middle class. You're, you're much above middle class, just the same as the CEOs in, uh, uh, with these uh, 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 jamboree, for example. So, no, I would say thank you, but no. I don't know if you saw, there was an article in the New York, in the uh, Los Angeles Times just last week. It was the head of one of the homeless service agencies can't afford to live in Los Angeles and had to move back to Indiana. We don't make, that. that is a complete fallacy and frankly, I find that insulting. Well, it's you the developers. See it. it's it's the developers. Well, it's not just the developers, it's like, all the red tape, it's all, all the bureaucracy that goes on. Well, well, and, but even the developers, nonprofit developers, aren't making huge money. Let's look at regular developers. When we have a system that says you have to make starvation wages because what? You're solving a major crisis? People deserve to be fairly paid. Do I get a reasonable salary? I do. Am I, you know, four or five hundred thousand dollars? It's pretty high. It's yeah. pretty high. <laughs> you know. We but, thought that you make almost three hundred thousand dollars a year. Yeah. Is that true? Right? Yes, that's and true. so that's minimal to you. The, the, your the friends, you, you and your friends are way above our money. So you're telling me that because I make, which isn't an incredible salary, <laughs> well, well, okay, fine. I make I make a really decent salary. I work friggin' hard at it. Yeah. So and we, why so, so you're you're sitting there okay we're getting off on what oh, i'm yes. making yes. and that's that has anything to do with the problem we have yes, yes. yes. i'd like to change the subject oh, please <laughs> so after i retired i worked for 12 years at a you know, the largest um, supported housing location in claremont 150 units um, and everyone has to pay 30 percent of their income mm -hmm. etc same thing and it's like section eight um, but they do have house rules mm -hmm. and if people invite in a grandson or whatever it is 
to live with them and the grandson brings in trouble with drugs or bullying or whatever, um, they have to fix it or else they lose their housing. Now, it has become a very nice place to live, even though it wasn't when we started getting involved. I see the housing first law as being 100% wrong because it gives a whole list of what you cannot hold people accountable for. You say that you, on one of your slides there, it says nothing can happen if someone chooses to do drugs, but in, under federal law, if they're using drugs and it's proven and it's repeated, you can lose your housing where I volunteer. But these new things under Housing First and where you can't build it unless you're dealing with chronic homeless who have a lot of issues, uh, I think it's totally wrong direction. And I'd like to know some big numbers. I've been told that California now has 30%, a third of all the nation's homeless. Mm -hmm. I mean, are we making progress? What are the numbers in progress since Housing First was created? Well, I can tell you in the last three years in LA County, we've permanently housed 83,000 people. If we didn't have the inflow, different people, if we didn't have the inflow, we actually would not have homeless people because it's about 75%, 75,000. So actually it is very successful. And I will tell you about housing first. If we start making, using drugs, a prerequisite of housing, there would be millions of people in California homeless who live next door to you and down the street. The drug use in housing is as high as it is on the street. And we don't know about it. Now, if someone commits a crime, we are totally 100% behind. Yeah, that person needs to face the consequences. We do not allow illegal drugs on the property, but if somebody comes in and they're high or they're drunk, what good is it going to do to anybody to say, you're out of here. Instead, we work with that person, AA, Narconon, all of those other programs, and there is evidence, a study, recent study just done out of UCLA, that showed that Housing First is the most effective when it comes to helping people with substance use. Again, stability. Now, is everybody going to get clean and sober? Heard of Matthew Perry, who just died? Rich had friends, had a community, had family, and he struggled for decades with substance abuse. It is one of the most difficult things. We have a choice. Keep people safely, stably housed, with supportive services, helping them to deal with it, or sticking them back on the street where they're in an encampment, and they're gonna definitely be back on drugs. Um, let me, and I welcome your attitude. I've worked in the nonprofit sector my entire life. So the, the salary issue, yeah, can be an issue for people, but, but I welcome your attitude. Um, what happened here, and there's two different things. There's something that's happening now, and there was something that happened before, which was the buy right, okay? Mm -hmm. And our city council, when, when the staff came in, and I don't know, I can't say who all the people were, and we saw it on television, you know, because it was televised, you know, or zoomed, whatever. Uh, three members of our city council knew nothing about it, not a thing. Two members of the city council knew, or we don't know if they knew, they may have not been known versus thought. Oh, they knew. Okay. And, and well, I can't prove that. Uh, I can prove one, I can prove one another. But so it was stuffed down our throat down the throat of people who live close to it. It was, it's it's going to be built, or I suppose it's going to be built, it's called Larkin Plain, mm -hmm. Larkin, whatever. But, and it, it was stuffed down our throat in an area that is by a, our only intermediate school, that is by a preschool, that is, the, and the folks at, at, at the retirement community wanted this one retirement community, but we've heard that folks in other retirement communities rather don't necessarily want it. Um, <coughs> right in the middle, the worst, I mean, it was a single story, two stories at the most, four stories. It was a disaster waiting to happen. 
Now there's another group coming in in a different location it's called Mercy House. Yeah. Who are doing a whole yeah. different thing. Excellent. And I'm th yes, and they're coming talking to people. Mm -hmm. They're talking about their rules. They're talking about they, they have concern for the community. I, I sent out 500 flyers yeah. to the community. Yeah. And Jamboree sent out a sum total of three. So, so a, it was a whole different. Now, I have a and sense they that you have. I've been in the nonprofit center. I have a sense that you have some of that same way of operating, trying to operate. And what they also said was we don't. We're, we want the state to realize that we, be, we need to be doing this in an area that is appropriate for, you know, for the housing. And so the second area that has been chosen is next to houses. There are houses, but it's more it's more connected to a commercial area where there's a lot of ability to get groceries and shopping and stuff. Close like to bus stops. And close to bus stops. Transportation, so, yeah, is very so, important. So there's services. all of this, you mm -hmm. know, and that's one of the, and they've said to us, they're trying to say to the state, you, you know, you sh you're making it worse for us. The bureaucracy is making us wor it worse. So that's what happened here. And therefore, there's a, a major amount of hostility mm -hmm. over just the term housing for because when you read the mm -hmm. legislation, it scares me. Mm -hmm. um, I think absolutely there needs to be better community connection. That's a lot of the work that we're doing right now, is working together with communities. Um, and I'm gonna, again, I'm going to use El Monte because it just happened. We work <coughs> closely with not only the elected officials, but the city bureaucracy, with the police, with the fire department, all of that. And I can tell you that they welcomed housing. We had an opening last week and every single city councilor talked up there about this was the most proud moment of their time as an elected official in housing our neighbors. But again, I'm going to get back to something I talked about, and that's how we view people who are homeless. Because as soon as we start talking about, well, there's a school next door, the implication is these are bad people. The implication is they're criminals. And are there people who are homeless who are criminals and bad people? 100%, 100%. Are there people that live in the house down the street from you bad people and criminals? 100%. A person who is homeless is 10 times more likely to be the victim than a criminal. And with proper supports, and we do have limitations, we would never put someone who has any, you know, child molestation or anything like that in housing there. We do not do that. I don't believe that's 100% true. That, there, that there are a lot, they're, they, they're making exceptions now. Not, like not in permanent supportive housing. It is actually a law that we have to follow. It is a law. But there's certain levels of child molestation and doesn't capture all of them. Your neighbors. We don't accept that. I don't accept yes. that. Yes. You don't accept an excuse. Excuse. I'd like to bring up another situation because housing alone, you've said it here too in some ways, but you imply housing doesn't. Well, we've had our own experience. We had a motel, like Karen Bass is trying to do in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And they said, okay, let's allow homeless there. It grew to where it was 90% homeless. Mm -hmm. The city claimed that they knew nothing about that. Um, I don't believe it. But what happened was when we finally got the city to go and be actually at that site, they found it was uninhabitable. Mm -hmm. They brought the fire. Mm -hmm. There were fire department problems. There was mold everywhere. There were women, a woman with a, a daughter given a voucher from Mona saying she wouldn't stay there 15 minutes. It was so awful that people with vouchers said, I'm not staying there. And in the end, 
the owner decided so much damage had been done to the building that it's being torn down right now. <coughs> That's what's going to happen with all these motels. Karen Bass is going to fill with homeless because she thinks just putting them in a roof solves it. You have to have a lot of support, and this motel didn't give them any maid support, right? So the very low standards that they've been living with while they were homeless uh, <coughs> ruined the facility, frankly. So it takes a lot of support, and so we need that support. And how can we trust that we have enough support <coughs> to maintain the $800,000 a unit place to be actually still standing, you know, in, in eight years? I mean, I totally agree with you. Supportive services are, <coughs> I, I will never say that it's housing alone. It is housing plus intensive supports, wraparound that's, supports. That's what I wish you, and now hush up, I've spoken a lot, but I wish in your presentations you would say it is not simple <coughs> housing only, because we're smarter than that. We're not clueless. Well, we have seen this, and true. it's got to be provided with resources. So when yeah. government says, oh, I'm doing it because it's cheaper, and I won't give you the resources, and you've outlined it historically, yeah, people pull the resources, we know what's going to happen. So uh, the Housing First law is terrible. And recent laws that have come out from California that they're, they're saying in when you work with managers of apartments, you can't even advise them to check on the criminal history of someone who's going to come live there. I mean, this is the kind of thinking that's going on in Democratic-led California right now. And I'm a, I've been a Democrat my entire life. And I can't believe, I mean, they're just, we get the chairman, we get the leader of China here. We can't take him to San Francisco. <laughs> Two days ago, we got to take them down the, it's terrible, it's an embarrassment for the city. So let me ask uh, for you. For this whole state? Let me ask state. you. And if what is he if thinks not, he's going to be president, he's smoking it too. If, 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 if you're, <laughs> <laughs> if you're, if you're saying housing first is wrong, what is the solution? What is the solution? Housing and services as necessary for that person and for the people that don't need help cleaning bathrooms, etc. Like where I work, Section 8 works fine. You know, just give them the but financial I don't understand. support. In one, in one thing you say, housing first doesn't work, you need supportive services. Housing first has intensive services. We have 24-7 staff, caseworkers, social workers, mental health workers, addiction he support. Us, Jamber, All that's that is part of, it's not housing first and can't get funded for housing first if it doesn't have supportive services. So if people are doing something badly, then you don't say, well, let's throw it all out. You say, no, it has to be done properly. That's why we have a 97% retention rate and don't have community backlash because we provide those services with the housing and we work together with the community and it is it works. So it's a bad model, not the model, if that makes sense. We have people in our that have advised us that have seen firsthand the people that are in these living in these facilities that don't follow the rules and cause all kinds of havoc, even under the same auspice that you're saying. You're saying that this doesn't happen. We're saying it does, and we have proof that it does. And there are complications with it. And even though you say 88% of the people stay housed, there's 12% that don't, and you admit they can't be helped. You said 3%. I don't know where the 3% No, I didn't say they can't, can't be helped. But in fact, I said just the opposite. That, that they are not. I said they may not be right for that type of housing, but we get, and I, let me tell you another example. I told you we have literally thousands of people throughout San Gabriel Valley in apartments. The same people, okay, the same people. We work with over 400 landlords. We've lost one landlord because her children were coming back to live with her. Our landlords tell us that they so appreciate the fact that if there's a problem with their tenant, we are there. Their tenant didn't pay rent this month. Their tenant was being too noisy. Their we are there and 
what we've been told time and time again by these landlords, and these are regular landlords, these aren't nonprofits, these are just regular landlords. They say, we wish you, we had you with every one of our tenants because the problems our other tenants give us, nobody comes and help us and I have to go and evict and go to court. So are there homeless people that cause problems? Of course there are, they are people. But again, are there people living in apartments that cause problems that have never been homeless? Absolutely, people are people, that's what we're saying. These aren't human beings, these are people. And if we treat people like people and provide the supportive services they need and the stability that they need, it does work. Can you tell me anecdotes of when it did work? 100%. I can give you anecdotes of all sorts of things that doesn't prove that something doesn't work because one or two things happened. And I think, you know, you have to look at the preponderance of evidence and experience throughout the country and say, does something work? John, 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 I have John, 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 what do your statistics show? You, you mentioned El Monte, how wonderful they did their thing over there and it all worked. What do your statistics show that when they got their homeless, what prevented or have they now have, do they have a flood of new homeless because they found out no no new homeless are coming into their to their city? Oh, I, I, to, to I, I, won't, I won't say that, but what we do know is the vast majority of people there who experience homelessness are from there. And again, it's another, it's another myth that we hear all the time. All the people come here because of the weather, right? We know that about 95% of the people experiencing homelessness in LA County were living in housing here in LA County before they became homeless. They, nobody travels when they're homeless. People stay as close to their own community as possible. And this is, again, massive amounts of evidence because okay. they feel safer in their own community. Okay. So what I, what I just want to say is what we see as we get new homeless is not, is people in that community losing their housing. And this is the crisis we have right now that people are losing housing because of the cost of living every day. Okay. I don't think there's one single person in California that has a local problem that says, look, We'll take care of our own. If it's homeless, we'll take care of our own. What the problem is, and I don't think this is a myth, we have had a couple of cities, big cities, I'm not gonna name them, everybody knows, who have declared they are sanctuary cities. We have had a state that says, essentially, we're a sanctuary state. Mm -hmm. I, it's hard for me to believe that all those people that are now identified as homeless have been here and living in our area. I tend to think by advertising for it, people are coming from other areas in our state, and I think that's what Californians are getting upset about. If it's our own in our own town, I don't think there's any California that isn't ready to sit down and try to get a sensible solution. However, if we're importing and we do this and the word gets out, I have a feeling there are states that are going to ship their problems here. I think that's what's happened in the future. I, I don't know for sure, but it sure looks that way to me for all of a sudden for us to have. And I think, I think you, somebody mentioned 30%. I'd say that's even, that's probably even low. I think, I think we've got a lot more coming from other states and they're coming across the border and they're saying, we're going to the sanctuary state in California. You know, I, I can argue with you because we have, we actually track all the people and we know where they come from, we know their addresses before they were homeless. So they you're telling me that everybody in San Francisco has always been in San Francisco and then they're, all, they're, li they're now living on the street because for whatever reason they were put out of their house. The, and the same thing in Los Angeles, all those people. That is the, very difficult for me the, to believe, the majority but I of them hear are. that you've got the staff, Now, I, I will say that people move to California for a variety of reasons. You know, we get people coming out, they want to be in the film industry, right? They come out here, things fall apart, they, they lose a job, they can't afford the rent here, and they become homeless. Were they originally from Nebraska? Yes, but they actually came here, were housed, and things fell apart that we see. That is about 20% of the people experiencing homelessness were from other states, but were housed and then became homeless. What we know 
is that when you are homeless, people A, don't have the money or the means to travel. I used to travel, I've been to almost every single state in this country working on homelessness. Every single community I have been with says they are not ours. They have come to us. Podunk City, Nebraska says they're coming here because we have services. Our weather is good. And when we do the studies, they're going no because people want to stay as close to their community because that brings them a sense of security. Now, do people move, you know, from here to Rancho Cucamonga or to, yes. There will be movement in a local area, but the vast majority of people, I think right now in, in El Monte, 80% of the people who they've gotten housed are directly from El Monte, and the rest are from the surrounding area in the, in the San Gabriel Valley. So it is a common misperception, and of course we have great weather, and let's be real, the news on, on TV about Californian homelessness, how many people do you think really go, that's where I wanna go? I want to go to Skid Row. I want to live there. What sort of staffing level do you have in the facilities? So we the numbers in like hours that they're there. In in terms of the various facilities, yeah, it really depends. There's there's different. So if we have a family building, for example, and everybody is you know working or in school or whatever, we will have staff there during the day, and somebody on call. If it's a chronically homeless building, people with higher acuity. We staff those 24 seven. So like eight hour shifts then? Mm -hmm. so the yeah. yeah, yeah, we, we staff up, um, you know, in some of our buildings, again, depending, we, we look at who the clients are. We usually have security. What sort of level of burnout do you have with these employees? Burnout is extremely high, but I can tell you it's not because of the clients. Okay. It's but not because of the people. Right? Okay. We do a lot of support. We work with our staff. They signed up for this. They care. They will tell you that the reason they are leaving the sector is because of the bureaucracy and community pushback. And they say, I try to help these people, <coughs> and all I get is we don't want those people in their community. And they've built relationships. They see these as people. That's what's burning them out, not working with the individuals. And we actually do exit interviews and write this all up. And so, yes, there's burnout in our sector. Do you have like vacancies for positions right now? And what many, is that? Many, many, so many, many. So is many. that a challenge in looking at these sort of programs that actually have an adequate level of staffing to meet the needs of um, these purpose core housing units? Our, our housing and our both interim and permanent, we make sure we staff up. Where it's usually affected is more of in our in our in our outreach or in our other other programs that we do because we recognize the importance of stability and the buildings. So we keep the staffing levels high. You know, is there turnover? Sometimes when you short a staff person, we get those filled pretty quickly. Uh, again, it's more things like our outreach staff. We have trouble hiring people in our back office, but that's <coughs> everybody out there will talk about that. Trying to get finance people, trying to get contract people, because we have so many government contracts. So we're in the same boat as a lot of other businesses are right now, and staffing is difficult. But you know, again, we look at where we absolutely need people, and so so we we do that, and we have quite a few buildings. Sort of compensation level are these people at like twenty bucks. I know they're trying to do like fast food at twenty dollars. I know it's kind of crazy. And you know, again, it is an issue because social services in general are paid less. Um, Nonprofits, teachers, you know, all of those things. It's not great pay, and um, so we're doing a lot of advocacy around so those kinds of things. You would have on-site housing for some of that staff then? In some cases we in some out. cases we have, depending on the size of the building, you have to have like a resident manager who, who lives there. And they um, just do management of that? They don't provide the wraparound services, right? So everybody that works in our buildings is trained in a certain level of trauma-informed care, mental health de-escalation, all of those things. So we train everybody. Even our security staff are trained in all of that. 
but then we have specialists that go in that work you know you have your case manager who is usually a master of social work or even a licensed clinical social worker we bring in medical services we bring in people who are experts in you know, like mental health issues we work with treatment centers and addiction specialists we work with job trainers we do a lot of job training employment we get people their geds and get them education we do financial planning we do parenting classes we do community integration where we connect people to faith groups or they want to go swimming so we'll connect them to a swimming pool so they get activities you name it we will provide it but it's very customized person by person you may not need anything to do with drugs because that's not your issue but maybe you desperately want to get your GED and you want to get a job so we work with you so we have we work with lots of partners we work with 130 agencies in the San Gabriel Valley and we work together to make sure that every client gets what they need to move towards wellness and stability. And that's why this, this, that's why this model does work, because we provide all of those things for people. And we do not allow criminal activity, and we have evicted people. And any violence, there's no tolerance, any of that. So it's not a free for all. At your place. At all of our places. I'm, I'm afraid to say anything. Pull it on all sides. Go ahead. It's your turn. No, no, no. Just, just something that I wanted to say. That's not necessarily just on on the topic itself. But you know, you just you did make the point. People are people, and that's one of the things that we need to be thoughtful of here, all the way around. Um, regardless of income level, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of all of that, a big problem we're having in our society right now is trust, and that's that's the, that's the key problem um, and so just as you say you've got to build trust with people who are on house to get them to you know come to you to accept the services the same goes for people that are housed that have concerns and I, I and I, I can't disagree with with some of the comments made here many of the folks here feel the way some of these unhoused do in terms of the way you know these things just come forward surprise and you know there was never you know this is the better approach start with something like this where you bring in people you know that have um, knowledge and share it and make the points and be able to have the discussion because i think you know i i will i will go on record i am one of the council people and sue said i was not aware of this the, the discussion that i had with a group called i'm the longest serving so i've got some history here mm -hmm. you know we, we had a staff member who went to work for almani and in his role there, developed a veterans housing uh, development. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they were very excited about it. They invited all of us as council to go oversee, and we thought this would be a great idea. And so we as a council, in a priorities meeting, public priorities meeting, were putting on there that, you know, we were supportive of a, of a veterans housing approach um, to, to uh, doing something. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was going back 2017, like the last time it came to the council. And then, of course, we had a change in council. Um, and then um, one of the projects that came forward that didn't develop, that didn't, that got interested was current support housing, and, and nobody really thought much about, about it because, for one thing, it was all one story. Um, it was senior population. I think a big one, it was being run by our actual mental health agency, Tri City Mental Health, so that also you feel that there's an agency that this is what they do in their business, so it's, it's more trusted. Um, you know, they had the option to build multi-story buildings, though. They were right next to a development that's three stories. And they did, they, they chose to bungalows, keep a low, low, uh, low profile, plus um, they were going to deal with the senior population. And there was no pushback on that. It was a unanimous decision before the, the market place uh, development came forward. So then suddenly that just kind of came forward. And the thing that I was concerned about is, you know, the fact that they're doing a four-story development at the point, Buildings in that community were, were only about, you know, the, 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 the institutions that are even there are only two stories. So, you know, that bothered me. And, and that was the thing, at the time I wasn't even thinking about any of the other things. As other folks got involved and started asking questions, other things, you know, came forward. But, you know, I just felt on that. I already know how development goes in this town. And some, you know, you, you let something like that go through in the middle of COVID when nobody's paying attention. And someone's come back, whose brilliant idea was to put this, this huge monstrosity in this two story neighborhood? Point being, there, there are a lot of missteps here, and, and that may, maybe maybe one of the good things that's come about with Larkin is at least now people can see a process with Mercy that's proceeding more reasonably than the process did with Larkin. There's a stark difference, admittedly, 
Um, congratulations to Mercy. I hope things you know go very well for them, and I think you know that that will that will maybe be the redemption for our community that we can have community members come together and have something good come. You know, but because it was done, you know, we, there was there was like just as we have we need to give trust to people who are on house. We gave trust to residents as well in in embracing them and bringing them through the process. So I just wanted to offer that observation. It's not a consolation to anybody here. Um, it's not trying to take sides either way, but you know, I think in general we need to find better ways of, of doing processes and recognize that to your other point, all the parties are screwed up. I mean, you know, they, one party came up with with the with the with the wrong approach, but also a, a right approach. To your point, um, but even as we sit here today, both parties have major divisions. One party can't agree on Israel; the other party can't agree on a speaker. Um, and, 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 these, and it seems like every policy coming out is always the extreme. That's the problem. When you come out with just ideological extreme approaches, there are unintended consequences, and that's the problem too. So, and, and even there, it can it can it can you know destroy a good policy because you know you you didn't really um, bet it well and think through everything, and there are elements that come out that undermine even your good policy. I, so. I couldn't agree more, and I think working together with community is the way we absolutely have to work. And it's both it's on both sides. And one of the things that it's it's all that you talked about, and I totally agree about politics right now. Um, that's why I believe in evidence-based things, not ideologically based, but what does the evidence say? But the other thing that I would say to any community is there is so much fear and so many myths that have, on, on every side, that have created all sorts of things that have kept us as a state, as a county, as cities, from actually moving to solving a crisis. And one of the things that we find is we work with, we talk to communities all the time, people that have all different views, and I respect people have their perspectives and their views. What we say to people is, come and see, come and talk to people, come and spend time. We're not gonna to try to convince you. We open our doors to say, come and meet people, come and talk, come and see what's working, come and see everything. And again, you're transparent. I'll give you a little- Is that, is that an invitation to come? Because I think I, maybe we should have a field trip. It'd be kind of nice to- Absolutely. We do this a lot. We actually will take buses of people. We will take you to all of our buildings. We'll Are you planning to build here? Are you no, we don't. We're not a developer. So you don't need to worry about us. We don't develop. <laughs> yeah, we don't <laughs> need, but we purchase some buildings that were already built. In most cases, we are just the service provider and somebody else actually owns the building. So we don't, we don't do development. But when we have people come out, and again, we had, I'll give you an, an example. We ended up doing that. You remember Project Room Key during COVID when they, they took all these motels? Oh, yeah. Okay. So we went into, we were asked to do two motels in Monterey Park. We moved in, got all these people off the streets in. There were demonstrations around the hotel, local community members with horns beeping and big signs, so we don't want you in our community, go away, we don't want the homeless. And around, and there was one city councilor who was absolutely opposed to what had happened. And there was a lot of resentment because this was like, it's happening in your community, okay? He was furious, but he had the courage, and I will say the decency to contact us, told us right out he was absolutely opposed, but he said, I want to come and see it. And I said, sure, what time would you like to come? He said, no, because I don't want you to prepare. And I'm like, totally fine. You come by any time. I said, the only thing you can do is go into people's private rooms, but other than that, you're able to walk around, you can talk to anybody you want to, you can come in and see and visit. So we did. Within a couple of weeks, the police came to us and said things are so much better here in Monterey Park. This council member is one of our biggest supporters. He goes out and talks on our behalf. Not because I did something like this, but I said, we are totally open and transparent. You come <clears throat> in and you see what we're doing and you can talk to anybody you want. And he saw not only what happened in that hotel, 
But he then talked to the police and emergency services who said, oh my God, things are so much better on the streets because these people are not in front of businesses, they're not in encampments and tents, they're inside with constant supportive services, help. And again, we make sure that the people are not, if they're out on the street causing problems, oh yeah, you bet we'll deal with that. You bet we'll say, you cannot do that in this community. And so it's coming and saying, so I invite everybody here, if you are interested, we are happy we do this a lot to take you to any one of our buildings. You can talk to our clients, you can talk to our outreach workers, our social service workers, you can talk to all of them because we don't have anything to hide. And it is by actually talking to people and again, seeing people that makes a difference because we, we always see them as other and scary and I get it. I used to work in Skid Row. There were times that I would walk across the street because I would see somebody coming who scared me. I know what it's like. But I also see the difference between that and when we get people inside with, with those wraparound supportive services. So open invitation to anybody and everybody. And if I may. Uh, I just want to say, so you were saying mm -hmm. several of your properties and actually were housing actual Pasadena residents, like the majority were Pasadena residents? In Pasadena, yes. Okay, see, that's cool, because here we're not guaranteed that, and that's another reason why we have concerns. You know what you can do? Um, it is illegal by federal, you know, Fair Housing Act to say we're only housing our own residents. But what you can do, and we recommend this to communities, is you have a housing preference for your local community members. It's a kind of a way of getting around. So what that means is, and that's what El Monte's done, is we prioritize people from El Monte, but then if there are no more people from El Monte, then we take someone from South El Monte or Baldwin Park. I, yeah, you, you, I mean, it's, it's complicated though because we even looked at that when we were looking at um, courier place and, and they're, they're, you can do it even like on the first round, but then thereafter it's opened up to everybody. You can't do it again is another another challenge with that. Not to mention we're not putting, you know, we initially there was there was going to be funding offered by the city and then when um, the design, I'll be frank because I, you know, voted against it, I was already out of the equation, but then it came back for an easement and because we didn't grant the easement, they couldn't do the development as they had represented to get the city funding, so there's no city funding involved. So therefore, the city is not in a position to negotiate that, is my understanding. Oh, you know, that's a, that's a conversation to have, A, with us, um, but also, and I, I can find out more about that because I, I don't always get into those sort of technical details, but I know we do this in many cities. Um, and so, because I totally get and actually agree with the fact that if we're asking communities to step up, they should be able to get their own community members housed. I am 100% in agreement, and again, you know, so there's, there's still maybe an opportunity to do that even with Larkin Place that have worked through you to try to get a, a, a local preference at least. I mean that would that would that would soften the blow a little bit because I know a lot of folks weren't happy about that. Um, right. Especially when you're saying you know that that this is solving the problem and people are on the street. Well, in a way, it's it's a legal way of moving them because <laughs> you're moving them. They're they're coming from other parts of San Diego Valley here. That's not addressing our our unhoused. Right, I so. mean, housing is in such short supply that somebody hears, if you're homeless, and you hear there's a building opening, you're gonna wanna be there. But that actually isn't the way the system works. So the system is all a triage system that every person who experienced homelessness, we do an assessment, we look at where are they from, you know, what is their community, and if they say, my community is Claremont, okay you want to live in your own community so there can be a preference so we try as much as possible to put people in their own communities because it's better for them and it is a way of saying our community is actually dealing with our local problem 
Sometimes we have to legally work around fair housing laws. It's, it, it can be tricky because you know we can't disobey the law, but um, I think there are ways that we can do it. And what I will do is I will talk to my staff who do the matching and find out exactly how they do that and work with different cities. And I can, I'm happy to get back to you on that. I appreciate it because if we can make that happen, I'll connect you with our city attorney and city manager and see if that, there's if still some there's opportunity to in, incorporate that into this. Right, and I can't promise. Again, it's all law stuff, but um, we'll certainly look into it. Can you also look at making them seniors and not, and not just any chronically homeless? Um, that's often the developer will make a decision yeah, on. We've been asking them for the last year and a half, and they've dug their heels in and said no. Well, that's well, that's not a decision can that I, can I, I support to that. What I've heard, because um, I spoke to Catherine Barger's office, I guess what it is is when they represented their plans to get their funding, they represented as open to essentially all ages. If they go now and change it to just the senior population, they potentially put it at risk and they'd have to go back through the process. Oh, right, but they've already got their funding, so where's the risk? Oh, well, no, no, your funding is tied to, to all of that. Yeah, right, but it, 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 the, no fund, the people that specify the age is the county, and the county is saying it's okay, but the developer is saying no. No uh, guidelines per CES, the most recent one stipulate nine different sectors as right. qualified for special needs, one of which is chronic homeless and one of which is seniors, and there's veterans and ad nauseum. And they alluded to the fact, having known this situation in this community and the, and the location, the proposed location for Larkin Place, they, they acknowledged that seniors would be best. It is a senior zone. Right. See, with physical disabilities, chronic homeless seniors, whatever the case may right. be, they acknowledge that would be best, and the developer did as well, um, per Matthew Lust with CES, okay. and LOCTA also. And they said that they intend to, at the point in time, when they would be selecting individuals to be housed there, that the intent was to put that, that sector in there but they couldn't guarantee it and put it in writing. So they may, in fact, try to do that. I mean, right. they're, they're giving us a little bit. That, that's, the, that's the feeling of the supervisor's office. They feel that they'll, they'll make that sincere effort. The problem is they can't yeah. give it formally because then it puts their if the, if the person giving the money can't make that decision, why is it ever going to develop? Yeah, good point. It's, I, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not really up to the developer it's, it is looking at what the various funding streams are the other issue might be how many seniors are experiencing homelessness in claremont and sometimes the numbers are saying well there's only they're not looking at claremont they're looking at the spa four they're looking at all of San Diego spot, Valley. Saw spot three spot three spot three they're, they um, they can't look at just claremont there's, there's, there's the, the nofa specifically said no geographical preference Period. And and again, then that comes down to the do we do a clearing can we do a clearing? Yes, I don't we have to be out of here. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> See, I can talk to her. Anyway, I really want to say thank you, and I I appreciate you know the people have different viewpoints. I totally respect that. I appreciate tough questions. Um, you know, it's we're not going to get to the bottom of this crisis if we don't look at all points of view and come together and you know try to create some synergies and there may be areas where we never agree but i think we can all agree that we don't want homelessness in our community it's not good for anybody whether you're unhoused or whether you're living in houses in this community it is not a healthy situation and we need to solve it so we do need to work together to say how do we solve this problem in a way that does treat people with dignity respect and, and as as human beings recognizing that people have barriers and problems and we need to look at that too so again i thank you for the tough questions um and again different point of views you know i, I totally respect that and respect that um, you know you are all people who really care about your community and i know care about your fellow human beings so thank you for that and thank you for making me you know be on the spot <laughs> <laughs>
after we leave the room. Sure. Hand out cards and ways to contact you to continue the conversation. I, I absolutely think this is one, one meeting where the best questions of all were asked in a long time and the most engaging. So, well done. Thank you. And the second thing is that we're having a holiday party. Uh, uh, we are uh, pizza next month, right? And we'd like to invite you to join us. Well, thank you, pizza and people, my two favorite things. <laughs> so I, I'm always happy. And I also want, and we're leaving, uh, again, please open invitation. And if anybody wants, we can actually arrange a tour. Uh, but I also want to put out, uh, really, I know we're leaving, is we have Thanksgiving this week and next week. We serve people throughout the San Gabriel Valley. We had four times the number of people come yesterday than we've ever had in the past. That speaks to the food insecurity. Sticker shock when you go into the grocery store, a huge yeah. need. So check it out. If you know people that have something and they can make their way to Pasadena. I love uh, turkey. But and, and we need turkey. We went, I love turkey. We went through, we went through 500 turkeys yesterday. Is that all? Wow. Well, we, 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 we're probably going to do six to 7,000 meals. Wow. On these two days, that's the need that's out there. Here, let me give you my card. Uh, I remember you killed me. Oh, he's yeah. got. Yeah. But I don't have his my card, unfortunately. But it seems like you, you know me as a modifier. Yeah, absolutely.